So thank you for being here and welcome. You know, it's a, it's a Wednesday evening, right? What do you guys typically do on Wednesday evenings? Basketball game, right? <laughs> what do you typically do on a Wednesday evening? Uh, math homework? Well, for you, this is a better place. <laughs> what about you, Yolene? What do you typically do on a Wednesday evening? Church. Well, you know, whatever it is that you actually forego tonight to be here, I really want you to know that I appreciate that. The Alliance Francaise appreciates that, and uh, your presence is really precious. So thank you for coming here and engaging in a conversation about Haiti. Now, most of you might think, ah, Sorel Quetan, with a name like that, he's got to be from Haiti. And if he is from Haiti, well, he's automatically an expert on Haiti. Well, I want to first acknowledge that I'm not an expert on Haiti. Who I am for Haiti is someone who's committed to creating a conversation for Haiti that actually creates a future that's very different from the future that people think of and speak of, especially the future that you see in the news. So uh, that's what this conversation's about. We're going to go through a number of things and a number of spaces. Uh, my intention, and I invite you to, to actually join me and make it your intention, is that we actually have this conversation such that a concept or a view of Haiti that we have, that is the current view, starts to emerge as something that we, and I say we, each and every single one of us, can play a significant role in transforming. Not just the view, but really in transforming the conversation, what actually now starts to emerge are the actions, be they individual actions or collective actions, both internationally from the diaspora, the Haitian diaspora, or internationally from people who are not from Haiti, but are friends of Haiti, or not friends of Haiti, and want to participate in the transformation anyway. So uh, I'd love for you to engage that way, to actually create now the new conversation. All right, so before we get hot and heavy into that. Uh, I want to give you a little bit of what Haiti is, just to give you a sense of who the Haitian people are. Uh, Perry just came from Paris. Now, if you're from Haiti, whenever somebody's going somewhere, what would you do? You got it. <laughs> you know, it's, not, it's always like this, right? You know, uh, my mother's uh, from Lazile in Haiti. She's going from Port-au-Prince to Lazile. If she lets one person know, she's got 16 things to carry to Lazile. Okay? Now, if you're Haitian, you've got to do that. And if you're Haitian, guess what else you have to do? When that person comes back, whether you knew they were gone or not, as soon as you find out, you go up to them, just like I did to Perry earlier, and say, what did you bring? <laughs> and it's always a question like that, right? It's what did you bring? And then they'll go and rant off on whatever they brought. And then you say, well, let me rephrase that question. What did you bring for me? <laughs> and of course, the answer is nothing. But the question isn't asked to actually put a guilt trip on the person. It's actually asked in this context. And you'll find that in creating the new conversation for what Haiti is and who the Haitian people are, take this away with you. That the question is asked for this reason. Given my relationship with you and how much I honor you, it would have been great if you brought something for me. But you know what? Even if though you didn't, it doesn't matter. I still love you. Essentially, that is the spirit and the nature of the Haitian people. That's who we are. So uh, I stand before you today engaging you in this conversation. I gave you this little bit, right? So now you're Haitian. 
<laughs> you're automatically Haitian. And if you're, if you're not Haitian enough, I'll give you a little bit more later on. So essentially, here's how the evening's going to go. We're going to look and just create for ourselves in the context of the conversation that exists, what you hear from other people, what you hear on the news, and just your overall concept of what Haiti is now, whether you're from Haiti or not. And if you're from Haiti, uh, the concept will be different, but we'll explore that as well. So, and we'll look in the following areas. Uh, one, the people themselves, you know, how Haitians interact with one another. And we're going to skim over the surfaces of each, but we'll go deep enough to just give you a sense so you can engage in the conversation. Uh, secondly, we're going to engage in the state of the country itself, the things that make an economy work, the infrastructure, agriculture, the, the way the economy works, uh, Haiti's relative position uh, with its neighbors in the Caribbean and the international community, be it France or the United States, right? We'll touch on that. And then last but not least, we'll say, okay, so now if we were to envision a future where Haiti's transformed and you, we, played a significant role in making that happen, what would you do? What would you do? What would we do? And what would we ask others to do? So that's how the evening's going to go. And, uh, you know, feel free to interrupt, chime in, kick me. She said I was going to be inspiring and all that. If I'm not, you tell me. I'll try to be. <laughs> but essentially, it's not about you being inspired by what I say as much as it is by about you being provoked by the conversation and then being touched, moved, and inspired by what you come up with that you would commit to doing as your word. All right, so let's start. How many of you actually know where Haiti is? OK, how many of you don't? Okay, now who would tell her where Haiti is? Who would like to do that? Okay, go ahead. And if you're Haitian, you think it's 30 miles south of Miami, Florida. <laughs> All right. <laughs> And, uh, you know, to inject a little bit of humor, now that's where Haiti is. And uh, Haiti was one of the first nations to, to gain its independence as a slave nation. Uh, uh, first country. The first country. Yes, absolutely. The first country. Yeah, ah, there you go. <laughs> so, uh, you know, from, from that, uh, the thing that we Haitian people lament the most is that there is the rich history of who our ancestors are, from Toussaint Louverture to Dessalines to King Henry Christophe. Uh, these gentlemen are quoted in universities for the work that they've done. And to, to go from being the nation that the entire Caribbean and Africa looks up to as the country that defied uh, the status quo in the 1800s to where we are now, many of us from Haiti say, how did we get there? And uh, so one of the things I'm thankful for is first our ancestors. The second thing I'm thankful for is the fact that many of you and many people around the world have not forgotten where we came from and are still rooting for us to be there again. So the challenge is up to us. When the revolution happened, one of the things that happened in Haiti, Haiti was so prosperous as a colony that the French brought in loads and loads of slaves from Africa and 
in the space of time that that happened, in most of the other islands, this is what evolved. You would see that there was a first wave of slaves come in, and they would be there, and there'd be a second generation. In Haiti, it didn't happen that way. There were many waves brought to Haiti, and by, by the time 1804 came around, the population of slaves nearly was four to five times more than the population of other people. So, and, uh, so in the cont when you look at a war, you know, you could say uh, there is China or India, a few billion people, and you've got guns, right? You can shoot a few, but sooner or later, the masses will get you. So you could say that uh, that played to our advantage. And uh, the other thing that that did in terms of culture, when you have waves and waves of Africans coming in without a second generation being created, you'll find that in Haiti itself, uh, our culture is very, very close to African culture in the way that we think, uh, the way that we speak, the way we interact with each other, the way that we interact with what we consider is uh, our spirituality and all that. So, uh, so that gives you a sense of uh, where we've come from. Now, the current state of uh, Haiti, and uh, we want to take a short poll. You've heard the news. You've probably seen pictures on CNN. If you were going to summarize in a few sentences what you believe is in Haiti now and what the current state of the country is, what would you say? Who would like to say? Would you like to say? Total chaos, right? Good term. Good term. And you'd, you'd agree with that, right? Absolutely, absolutely. So chaos, anarchy, corruption, abject poverty. Who else? What do you want to add? What would you like to say? OK, great, great. And you know, everything you're saying, by the way, is accurate. And everything you're saying has the natural tendency to engender two sentiments from people outside of Haiti. And if we leave with nothing tonight, I want you to leave with this, OK? Two sentiments. On the one end, facing the abject poverty, the corruption, the anarchy, the chaos, there is pity. And I want to tell you, that's not the sentiment we need. So let's leave that right here. You guys promised me to do that? OK? Let's leave that right here. So there's the sentiment called pity. And then there's the sentiment called, uh, I, I want to look for the uh, appropriate word. We're either pitied or I want to use the word uh, blamed or something. You know, it's almost like this. It's like, you, you know, have you ever seen someone that had opportunity but wasted it? And then you say, it's your fault, like that. Right, so those, those are the two sentiments, right? And these two sentiments, actually, uh, I now want to take you through the kind of thing that those two sentiments will gen uh, have engendered over the years, and the reason we want to leave them here and create something new. So regarding Haiti, there are the people of Haiti themselves. Now, on the Haitian flag, there is a phrase. Who knows what the phrase on the Haitian flag says? L'union fait la force. Now, who would translate that in English? Unity breeds strength, right? Perfect. Now, if you look at Haiti, from the inside out, and from the inside in, you don't see any of that. And to a large extent, the pity that the view of Haiti engenders is actually inborn, not just in people who are outside of Haiti. It is also inherited in people who are in Haiti. And this is how it shows up. So I want to give you a sense of where Haiti is regarding its people living according to the phrase on the flag. Picture this. 
you live in, let's just pick any city. Uh, which city are you from in, in Haiti? You're from La Tibonite, right? So just to give you a sense of what engenders what. La Tibonite used to be the bed, the bread basket of Haiti. In La Tibonite, we grew rice, just like rice was grown, is grown in China. I mean, fields and fields and fields. And then bring in, you know, there's a child from that prosperous region. And there are no schools. Now, that child has a relative who lives in Port-au-Prince, the capital. And the child's mother says, you know, I'm just sick and tired of my child not being able to go to school and get this, that, or the other. Why don't I send my child to Port-au-Prince to be with my sister so that my sister can take care of him or her and have a go to school and take good care of her and, you know, maybe three years from now she'll graduate from elementary school and all that? Well, here's what happens in Haiti consistently and still happens to date. That child is actually an indentured servant. In Haiti, we call them restavec, meaning, uh, if you translate it literally in French, is someone who rest avec quelqu'un ou quelqu'une. Uh, rest, rester, uh, restavec, restavec. So uh, there is an undercurrent of. Uh, uh, it's really a grudge that's inherited and passed on in this way. And it's bred out of, one, the pity that someone from Port-au-Prince would feign, because it's not real. <laughs> oh, God, we'll take care of your child. We'll make sure that the uh, child gets uh, fed and goes to school. And mind you, I'm not painting people from Port-au-Prince or other cities with a broad brush. I just want to give you a sense of how internally we relate to one another and how that kind of division and angst contributes to what's here today. Can I interject? Yes, please. So you and you know, just, just to really bring it out in the room, I'd love to hear the sentiments that some of you have. So for you, it's frustration and anger. Who else would like to say? What's there for you? when you look at the current state of Haiti and you see what's there. Now, now that's, that's, that's great, right? But, but I want to take you somewhere else. And, uh, and, and this is part of the cycle that keeps it that way, right? When you go home, you're happy to be home. Mm -hmm. Yet, I would say that there is what's underneath the happiness mm -hmm. that you're not acknowledging that I'd love for you. Yeah, yeah, there's yeah. There's absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, there, there's a whole array of sentiments and feelings that, uh, that's engendered. Now, here's what's common. The, the one thing that's in common with all of them is that they actually don't contribute to progress and transformation. That's it. So, you know, that's not wrong. It's not bad. It just doesn't contribute to progress and transformation. So, uh, you take all of that and you say, okay, what has that produced since 1804? So let's take a look at uh, the, the land itself. Haiti used to be lush. If you were to take a guess right now, what percentage of the tree coverage would you say is left on the face of Haiti? The side that goes Dominican Republic border west. What percentage would you guess? Huh? Less than 10? About 10? You're really close. It's about 1.58%. So uh, here's, here's, here's 1.58. What does that translate into? So you speak of deforestation, and now it's going to like desertification, where there are aspects and areas of the country that are becoming deserts. Yeah. And, uh, and here's why, right? And this is where some people you could look from the outside in and blame and say, gosh, what were you thinking? So 
since 1804 and before 1804, one of the things that Haiti was very well known for was its mahogany trees. Hard, fine woods were actually the engine of economic growth for the colonies. So since... And rubber trees. And rubber trees. You know, since day one, what's been happening is the systematic exploitation of the land for its goods, trees, whether they be mahogany, acacias, you, na you name it. Fine hardwood furniture, rubber trees, you name it. By the boatloads flying out. Now, that started the cycle. Now, 1804, we're independent. The French are out of the country. And we have to cook. We have to eat. We have to power industry. We have to make uh, uh, cane syrup. And our favorite thing, clairin. How many of you know what clairin is? <laughs> so just to give you just to give you a little bit more of Haiti, okay? In Haiti, in Haiti there used to be sugarcane fields from Port-au-Prince all the way down to Petit Guave. And these sugarcane fields produce all the sugar and all the molasses that Haiti consumed. And one of our favorite byproducts of sugarcane is the alcohol that comes from it. And it's one of the best. So clairin is that. So uh, if, uh, if, if you want to joke with a, with a Haitian, uh, you can, uh, you, know, you know how people say crackhead here? We have, <laughs> we have clearing heads in Haiti, <laughs> right? So now picture this, okay? That's been happening since day one, 1804. So now we've got an entire economy dependent on the trees of Haiti, from furniture making to actually burning the wood to power to power the, uh, the generators, to power, to power the, uh, the uh, bread makers, to power the dry cleaners, to power everything. So trees are cut by the millions in Haiti on an annual basis. And there's been nothing done to actually manage that the way it's managed here. And even when it's managed, it can run away from you. So to a large extent, so now you, you come from that and say, so why does Haiti have to put up with so many natural disasters all the time? The disasters actually aren't natural. They're man-made. So picture this, 1987, and that's not too far from today, right? In 1987, there was 25% of the tree covers left. In that year, there were two big hurricanes that hit Haiti. Nothing happened. There was enough to hang on to the dirt and hang on to the water. Last year, when Ike and the four hurricanes come around, many of them actually didn't hit Haiti. You actually had the tail spins of them and the rain dumped on the mountains. So now in Haiti, it takes about 12 inches of rain to create what you would call a natural disaster. Mudslides, entire cities covered, and hundreds of people uh, dying. So uh, I'm taking you through this. Now, if you're, if, if you're starting to like crank up the pity uh, meter, crank it down, OK? Because <laughs> that's not the intent. I'm really taking you through this to give you a sense of what the sentiments that are engendered both within and without Haiti uh, really keep it status quo. Yeah. And, and you know, the, the flip side of what you're talking about has happened. In, uh, in, in places where, quote unquote, a nation depletes its natural resources and is seeking more, they could invade the other country and claim it for themselves. 
uh, for a long time now through a series of occupations and a series of actions by outside governments, the Haitian quote-unquote army or government has never been in a position to actually do that. So to that extent, the flip side of what you're talking about has happened. In border towns in Haiti, those who cannot feed their own actually migrate into the Dominican Republic. And now, whether consciously or unconsciously, I'm not here to blame either side. Whether consciously or unconsciously, what's happened is that Haitians migrate to the Dominican Republic and are now not employed, but engaged in what is quasi-forced labor in the sugarcane fields in the Dominican Republic. So uh, the, it's not so much the reverse, but something similar to it is happening. Those who don't have the resources are migrating to seek it, and they're getting some of it, but at a pretty, pretty steep price. Yeah. Well, and we're, we're getting there, right? But, but you, you mer we, we must first take the moment to just be with what's so right now. And just be with it without making it wrong. It's just what it is. It is what it is. So now what are we going to do about it, right? So you, you, you get the picture about the environment, right? 1.58% left. And guess what? I went to Haiti in November. Trucks and trucks and truck loads of what we call charbon coming from the outskirts of the country into Port-au-Prince. So people are still cutting trees, burying them, burning them, turning it into charcoal, and selling it. Oh, no. Well, they don't have anything to plant, right? So, you know, that's, that's the environment. And now you, you, can, you, you can take that, you know, for, for a country to really work. That there's first its natural resources and uh, vegetation and tree covers huge for that. So you can say that that's depleted. Uh, second, there's the relationship that that country enjoys with its neighbors. That's really critical. So uh, the opinions and the positions on how Haiti's treated by foreign countries and its neighbors go from here to there. You get either end of the spectrum, right? Depending on where you are and how much, how much money is flowing into your pocket. So here's a synopsis of Haiti's relationship to its neighbors and other countries. In, uh, when Haiti became independent, France actually said to Toussaint, l'ouverture, this country was our property. Now, if you want to claim it for yourself and you want to be independent, pay us retribution. So there became a debt, a sizable debt, to actually buy the country. And our ancestor, Toussaint Louverture, agreed to that. And Haiti spent years and years and years paying that debt back. So if you picture this, independent country in the middle of the Caribbean Sea, surrounded by what? Go beyond the water. Slave owners and slave traders. So in that context, there is what you could say is a conscious and systematic isolation and exclusion of Haiti. Now, systematic isolation, based on, you know, who I am, who you are, and systematic exclusion, where, yes, you're independent, you paid for your country, yet you're not allowed at the table, so to speak. So that continued throughout the years. And uh, in 1915, the American army went to Haiti and occupied Haiti. And there were two separate occupations that lasted almost 30 years. So in that space, this is what happened. And I'm going to use the word emasculated 
okay, to give you a sense of how Haiti as a country is crippled. So the emasculation happens this way. The country is occupied, and now we're going home. But we still want to hang on to what we have. So we're going to put in power a government headed by one of us. And that one of us is a Haitian. And we're going to ensure that that government stays in power and is replaced when it's replaced by another one that's just like it. So the systematic isolation continued in the same way. First, through, yes? What was the state of reason for the occupation? What did they, what did they say they were uh, they, there, there are several reasons used for occupation, and none of which you'd say is accurate. Uh, to one, keep the peace. So peacekeeping is always uh, a reason for occupation. Another good reason for occupation is always a humana humanitarian bent. We're going in to actually uh, feed the hungry. And another reason, and another reason is usually this. <laughs> Given the proximity of the country to the United States, instability in that country can actually bleed over and go there. And back in uh, the 1915, 19, uh, the 1900s. So what are you getting from the conversation? Yeah. OK, good. And uh, what's present for you now regarding Haiti? And what's starting to bubble up right there where you're sitting? And I'm asking her the question. I'm actually asking all of you. <laughs> no, really, whatever's there is fine, by the way. <laughs> and, and what I mean by that is misinformation. Yeah, that's what I mean by that. Yeah, so the, it's, it's, it's both there, so you really have to sift through it. So really, from an, from an, an economic standpoint, uh, when you have a system like that, what, what's really happened over the years is this. So now, just to give you a sense of why we no longer produce rice in La Tibonit. So those who are in power are actually in power to serve a certain interest. And that's the only thing they've been serving. So a lot of what's usually put in place to actually safeguard la patrie, you know, the country, so to speak, uh, have not been put in place. So from when, when, when I grew up in Haiti, there was a factory that made sugar. There was a factory that made rubber shoes. There were factories that made furniture. And there was the rice in La Tibonite. Now here's what happened over the years. From 1986 on, when that started to dwindle and the people started to say, OK, what can we do for ourselves now? A lot of the business people who made commerce based on the structure started to be threatened. So they made business decisions. And one of the business decisions made was, well, why do sugar here? Why not import it? So the factory that did sugar closed down. So now Haiti doesn't produce sugar. It imports its sugar from the Dominican Republic and other countries and the United States. And uh, regarding rice, there was an agreement signed to actually say, we'll lift the tariffs, the Haitian tariffs on rice, which essentially made rice imported from the United States cheaper than the rice that the farmers can sell well, that was, that was in Haiti. That was part of the USAID package. I know. <laughs> there was an agreement made. That, that was part of an agreement. Now, uh, uh, not to interrupt you, but just to see, can you see how, how petty 
as a prevailing sentiment can actually drive to such a decision. And now that's, uh, that's what you've got. So you get, you get a sense for how the economy is struggling. And then there is education in Haiti. As of today, there are 52% of the Haitian population of roughly 8.5 million people who actually know how to read. Out of the 52%, yeah, 52% do know how to read. Yeah. Yeah. They do know how to read. But mind you, out of the 52%, fewer than 30 to 25 percent actually complete a grade that's beyond the fourth or sixth grade. So the, the well in Haiti picture this uh, there's no public school there are some public schools but they're not well funded okay so you could say there's no public school <laughs> Okay, there, there are no public schools. So, <laughs> what, <laughs> you know, what you get are a lot of people who are, the people who are educated now say, we need to do something. So they create schools. They become private schools. So in Haiti, you have a lot of schools that are run by private individuals. Some are qualified, some are not. The majority of it, however, goes like this. I'm not an educator. This is just a great opportunity to make some dough. So you end up with a system that is presumably educating, but really not. So... Uh, you could say that not 52 percent, but the majority of the population, except for those who go to the elite schools in Port-au-Prince, and some of the elite schools in Lecay and Cap Haitien, are functionally illiterate. So when you take that uh, sort of the three corners of it, right, the land itself and the challenge with deforestation and desertification, you take the political structure that is unstable and is systematically kept unstable for uh, very specific reasons. And then you take the education. So there is nothing feeding the pipeline with new leaders. There is no incentive for the existing leaders to actually do anything different. And the country itself, given the lack of incentives, is just wasting away. So that gives you a sense of what's so. So I want to pause there to give you an opportunity to react to that and start to say, well, what do you see that you want to do about that? You know, it's real. <laughs> ah, you want some clearing, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, just, just to kind of uh, uh, not, not conclude but wrap up this segment with another thing. I want to come back to, you know, the frustration. And the frustration and the anger can be as a result of, you know, we're sending money and the government is corrupt and we can't do anything with it. And so there is a situation in Haiti currently born out of the pity and the blame, okay? It is... God, they really need help. But you know what? We can't give them money because they'll put it in their own pocket and run away with it. So I want to give you a picture of the emasculation that's happened to the Haitian government. For every single department that a government has, imagine the Department of Labor, the Department of Energy, the Department of Education, the Department of X, right? Whatever it is. There has been a parallel organization called a non-governmental organization or an NGO established to in some way, shape, or form perform that function in Haiti in parallel with the government agency. So when aid money goes to Haiti, it doesn't go to the government. It actually goes to one of the NGOs. Who works in the NGOs are people who are not from Haiti. 
So the salaries and the studies and everything that needs to be paid to actually get, you know, a simple road project done. All of those monies are paid and bounce right back to where they came from. And then there's what's left to actually do a small project or a big project, but hardly ever enough money left to actually maintain it and ensure its survival and sustainability. So uh, the, the emasculation has happened that way to where you could go to a government agency. They'd love to help you, but they can't because they do not have the funds. They have no resources. All the resources are there. So what you've, what, what's happened in Haiti, you've heard of, uh, you know, uh, brain flight, where the brains go from one country to the other. Well, in Haiti, the brains have flown from the government agencies to the NGOs. So now even people who have the great intentions and want to do the things they want to do, these agencies are actually don't have the human resources or the financial resources to do anything. So uh, the current Haitian government has a serious challenge on its hands. And it's going to take a different kind of thinking to forward that. And so in this next segment, I want to invite us to actually start doing that different kind of thinking. But before we go there, you had your hand up and you had your hand up. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's address both questions. The first question is regarding health care. So like education, like the environment, uh, health care in Haiti, there's no public health care. You know, you could, you could take Nirvana, like Canada, and say, everybody's got it and it's great. <laughs> right like that and then you could take the United States where most people have it and some don't but by and large you know you could go to the emergency room and you're in Canada like that in most instances uh, in Haiti it goes like this first there are the environmental problems that exacerbate the incidence of diseases in Haiti so currently, uh, the Haitian Alliance is engaged with uh, the Carter Center. They've got a uh, systematic effort to accelerate the elimination of malaria in Haiti. So mosquito-borne diseases are rampant in Haiti. Malaria, uh, lymphatic filariasis, and things like that. So uh, there, there's that. So there, there is what's there in the environment that actually contributes to a higher incidence of diseases and malaise in Haiti. So there is the quality of the water, uh, the absence of uh, sewage and drainage systems that actually ends up where you create pools of water where mosquitoes can breed and other diseases can breed, uh, very uh, little access to running water. So people actually take water from streams to cook, wash, and drink. And then you put that on top of the sheer absence of funds for the Department of Health to deal with health care at uh, a general level. You end up with health care being dealt with this way. You've got uh, extremely great health care in a town called Hesh in Haiti. Uh, how many of you have heard of Dr. Paul Farmer? Okay, so I want to give uh, a lot of credit to Dr. Paul Farmer and uh, his organization and his donors. Huh? Yes, and his donors for creating an oasis in Haiti. So regarding health care, that organization in Hesh provides some of the best health care you'll ever find and people from Haiti file from cities all over the place to go to that place so uh, in Hesh so that's starting to give you a sense of how absent health care is because people from even the capital city go to that place to get treated or they go to Cuba okay so uh, there are pockets in Haiti where there's good health care 
financed by external organizations and people with great intentions and good hearts, but by and large, there's a health care crisis in Haiti. One, caused and exacerbated by environmental factors, and two, a people left unable to deal with it in the absence of funds and trained practitioners. And plenty of NGOs to support the cause. Okay? The second question, would you remind me of that? The key word you used was decolonization. France did not have the opportunity to decolonize Haiti. Haiti was, Haiti became an independent country as a result of a revolution. And when the French got out, there was actually no plan made for them to ever come back. Exactly. And, and, there, and there was, from their perspective, very little sentiment to actually uh, do anything to benefit Haiti. And that's not to make the French wrong. That's just the way it was. All right? Well, you can say that. <laughs> you had a question, too. Yeah, tell them, go anyway. I totally get that. Now, another sentiment that's bred outside of Haiti is fear. And the fear itself feeds on itself. You know, it's like, I'll ask you if I can go, and you'll say, man, you know, I don't think it's secure. No, and then somebody else asks me, and I tell, man, you know, she said it's not secure. It must not be, right? And then you ask him, and they go, and before you know it, there's this entire perception of uh, a place that's completely insecure, and if you ever set foot there, uh, you'd die the minute you do that. But does the State Department have a travel advisory or not? If I go and uh, look, I wouldn't listen to all of Yes, they do. Okay. Yes, they do. But that would scare me. Yeah. <laughs> that would. That's and that's the fear. That's and that's the fear. But that's right? <laughs> but, but seriously, this is it, right? You know what I'm saying? Like, okay, I live in Atlanta, right? That's just and, and, and here's the other thing you want to know. Uh, the St. Monica's Church, which is a Catholic church here, has a team of, uh, has a medical mission that goes to Haiti four times a year. And what they complain the most about are the road conditions. <laughs> you know, so, so, so here's the other thing that... Uh, <laughs> so here's what you can count on from the Haitian people. And as we're, we're moving into the shorter segment of actually creating something for you individually and for us collectively, uh, the Haitian people are very grateful. And uh, not only are they grateful they protect their own. And the doctors and the missions who go to Haiti become our own. So when a mission lands in Haiti, they're very safe. You know? And not only that, the people who are doing the deeds that you hear about that make Haiti unsafe do it for a very specific reason. They know what they're doing. And by and large, the people from medical missions, the people from Christian missions, are left unscathed. You'll hear a couple of incidents here and there. And since I'm on tape, I have to say this. I am not telling you to go to Haiti. <laughs> OK? And I'm not making a claim that Haiti's secure. But I'm asking each of us to now look inside and say, hmm, do I want to go cure the sick? And if you do, I say go. Follow your heart. Follow your heart. Right? So now, given what you now know about Haiti, I want to tell you a little bit about what a group of Haitians are doing here. And I want to invite you, if you're from Haiti, and even if you're not, to join us in that quest. There's a group of Haitians here in Atlanta 
that uh, incorporated a nonprofit organization called the Haitian Alliance. The Haitian Alliance sees to it that its mission is the following. To empower the Haitian community, and the Haitian community means to us the diaspora, the whole diaspora, and all of Haiti. To empower the Haitian community to act as one, create a future where Haiti realizes its full potential. And we create that mission inside of uh, a broad vision where each of the things that we addressed earlier, we actually have a vision for each of them. So for l'union fait la force, we actually have a vision called unity, truth, and reconciliation. So the angst and the grudge that we hold against one another the Haitian Alliance is committed that there be a Truth and Reconciliation Commission enacted as law and supported by the Haitian government and enacted as law by the parliament in Haiti to actually give people in Haiti the opportunity to heal. Because what you'll find is this. When an administration comes and does what it does in Haiti for four years or three or two, whatever it built you can be guaranteed that the next administration is going to do what? Destroy it. Destroy it. So there hasn't been any continuity in Haiti. So our vision of unity, truth, and reconciliation, we want to see to it that the Haitian people and Haiti itself heals such that there can be the fertile ground where people can work as one and actually do things that survive them and be thinking about doing things that survive them. So that's the first point in our vision. The second point is that Haiti is culturally and Haitians are culturally, economically and politically strong. And last but not least, that Haiti is green and literate by the year 2030. So that's the, that's the vision and the mission that anchors uh, the members of the Haitian Alliance and its friends. And to actually see that vision and that mission through, we've created five programs. And this is where I want to, you know, like, have the wheels in your brain start running, okay? To see where you personally and your resources and the people you know may fit. So our first program, we call it Truth and Reconciliation. We've partnered with two organizations there's an organization called the World Forgiveness Initiative and a local organization of uh, now maybe 16 young Haitian men and women who actually say this we are committed to ushering in a new era where forgiveness is the first response of all Haitians and all people so under that program we sponsor a forgiveness workshop once a year this year we're holding that workshop here in Atlanta on the 30th of August. And L'Alliance Francaise will be publishing the date and the announcement. I'd love for you who are members of L'Alliance Francaise to actually uh, participate and attend and be with us. And you'll find uh, information on our website as well. Yes. Yeah, I totally get that. So now a couple of things to clear up, right? I was there. I represented the Haitian Alliance, an organization incorporated in Georgia that has nothing to do with the guys from DC. So let's have that be clear, okay? <laughs> so let's have that be clear. And uh, number two, Joseph Alfred is a very close friend of mine and uh, we collaborate on a number of things. And uh, I hear your frustration, and here's my promise to you. The next time I address the guys in Washington, I will let them know of the impact of their behavior. And I will give them my brother's name as well. Yeah, <laughs> they felt yeah. That being a lawyer. Yeah, was yeah. And, right. and you can count on the Haitian Alliance to stand for truth and reconciliation and forgiveness for all people. That's who we are.
Okay. <laughs> all right. So that, that's our first program. So I invite all of you to join in. Now, I'm going to repeat this website over and over. So by the time we leave, you'll know where it is. It's www.transformhaiti.org. Okay, that's where you'll find us. You know, we're going to do some updates to it to, uh, to, to make it reflect everything that we're doing this year. And uh, so go there. The date for that workshop will be posted there. And the second program, we call it A Taste of Haiti. Uh, <laughs> you know, so, so, so I really want you to make big noise about that one. The mission we seek to fulfill under that program is this, that the Haitian culture is known far and wide for its contribution and its impact. So it's about our music, our photography, our paintings, our art altogether, our food, and the country itself. So you can expect the taste of Haiti. Uh, we've done it two years in a row. And mind you, we're working with uh, meager resources. So I'll also ask you at this point to go to our website and click on Give. You can adopt a tree or you can adopt a school. And you can help fund the growth and stabilization of the Haitian Alliance. So we did it two years in a row. Mind you this. Best Friends Park, so this year we're doing it there again, at Best Friends Park on July 5th. Haitian food. Huh? <laughs> What's that? Haitian moonshine. Huh? Oh, you want some clear eh? <laughs> All right, now she is really Asian now. <laughs> All right, so uh, picture this. The families in Gwinnett County, Jonesboro, Marietta, uh, you know, just get together and they say, you know what, we're going to cook our best and we're going to bring it to the park for people to taste Haiti. So you can count on Haitian food being there. And then the, those who love football, we call it football, say, you know what, we want a soccer tournament. <laughs> so last year we had a soccer tournament. And uh, there was a big trophy, and there were a number of men with big bellies <laughs> <laughs> running around pretending they're playing football. <laughs> and there were lots of people with cameras who took their pictures and made sure those pictures were published. <laughs> so uh, I'm inviting you to the Taste of Haiti. Because the taste of Haiti is really not designed for us in the Haitian community. It's designed for the people who are not from the Haitian community. So that the view that is now, we work together to transform that view. And I, I, I swear, I swear, if you taste, where are you from? You're from Ethiopia? God, have you ever had glio? No, you've got to come. <laughs> okay, so uh, really we, we, do, we do that in honor of Haitian culture, to actually promote it, to have it been known far and wide for its contribution and its impact. And at the end of the year, under that program, we close the year on December 12th with a gala. We call it the Gala for Giving. Uh, this past year, uh, two members of uh, L'Alliance Francaise were there. Thank you for doing that. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a big affair. You know, if you're the kind of lady who loves to wear a long gown, it's the time to step out. And if you're the kind of guy who loves to wear a tuxedo, I think you're that kind of guy. <laughs> you know, it's the time to step out. And uh, we, we do it, and we're structuring it this way. This is the th fourth year we're going to have it. And each year it's grown. And last year we had about maybe 250-some uh, people at the Omni. Uh, very nice affair. And this year we're looking to double it. Uh, why would you want to come? Forget the gown. Forget the speaker who's going to be there. Forget the plush environment of the Omni. 
but we do it all to raise money for Haiti being green and literate. And how does the money actually go there? We've adopted two schools in Haiti, one in the northern mountains of uh, Fursi near Port-au-Prince. And how many of you have heard of Earth University? In? Earth University in Costa Rica has structured the kind of environment where the school itself is an agricultural engine. So the trees that are going to make Haiti green were creating the model where the school actually grows these trees in a nursery. And from that nursery, when those trees are sold, the proceeds actually feed the school. They run the school, buy the books, educate the children, sponsor scholarships, and do all that with the monies generated from the trees. And from this end, the Haitian Alliance finances the startup of the nursery, the structure that's to undergird it and make it repeatable and reliable. And when we've actually refined it and make it repeatable and reliable, we go across the country and replicate it in other schools. So our vision is that Haiti's green and literate by the year, tw by the year 2030, because there are 50 or 100 of these schools implementing year after year this program. And once they've done it, they actually go teach other schools to do the same. So that's, uh, that's what the Haitian Alliance is all about. I wanted to introduce you to that. To start the wheels rolling for you. Because we can't do it alone. But with your input and your generosity, we can make anything happen. So what's starting to come up for you personally? What are you now saying? You know, I'm going to do this. Oh, I'm gonna, uh, just, uh, just, just to clue everyone in, Gonaive, where her father's from, is the city that sits in a valley surrounded by these mountains that have no trees on them. So when 12 inches of rain falls, all the dirt just come gushing down, and it did during the last four hurricanes. And uh, in the context of no resources and nothing to do, Gonaive now looks the same way it looked the day after the disaster. So keep going. OK, great, great. <laughs> so you know, as, uh, as, as you have, I, I invite each and every one of you to find yourself this evening. And you know, the plight of Haiti may not be that which you, which you choose to support. And I'm not here to tell you to do that. But I'm here, you to, I'm here to ask you to find yourself. And when you find yourself, give yourself. Will you do that? All right, so I'd love for you to write your email address on a sheet of paper for me if you want to receive communication from the Haitian Alliance. And uh, as you're doing that, I want to end on a light note, OK? One of the things you want to know, if you are Haitian, not only do you drink clear, and that, not, that doesn't mean you're drunk, OK? <laughs> and, uh, and you know, not only do you try to put a guilt trip on your friends because you want to say you love them, OK? But there's one thing you must do. You must tell jokes. You've got to tell jokes, OK? <laughs> so I want to leave you with this Haitian joke. <laughs> Uh-oh, where's that going, right? <laughs> so I want to leave you with this Haitian joke. <laughs> I know I'm on camera. <laughs> so uh, you know how Perry was talking about neighborhoods not being safe, and you were talking about Haiti not being safe. So some really smart scientists developed this machine that if you put it in any city, it would automatically detect all the thieves in the city <laughs> and point to their address, their phone numbers, everything. I mean, all you had to go do is nab them, right? Perfect machine. <laughs>
So they take that machine to Frankfurt in Germany. In about two minutes, 500 thieves are detected and nabbed. <laughs> wow! They were testing it, right? So they said, man, this is a great machine. We love it. Let's take it to New York and see what it does. <laughs> they take the machine, dump it right in the middle of New York. 10,000 thieves in less than a second. I mean, this machine is really working, right? They say, oh, let's try it someplace we wouldn't think there'd be thieves, you know? Let's go to Atlanta. <laughs> 500 thieves in no time at all. They said, you know what? How about try this machine in Haiti? Let's take it to Port-au-Prince. <laughs> they get to Haiti. They put the machine in Port-au-Prince, and in two seconds, it was stolen. <laughs> huh? So, uh, you know, another thing you want to know about the Haitian people. Uh, we love our people. We love people. We love to have fun. And, uh, and we love to poke fun at ourselves. And uh, so I hope that this evening has given you, through our interaction, a taste of Haiti. And has left you with the profound desire to make a difference. So I'm personally asking you to make a difference. All right? Now, there, there, uh, th there's a common saying in Haiti. I want to leave you with that, too. Uh, when we say Haiti, we often you add the word Thomas at the end. Thomas. And it, it translates like this. It's the Haiti of Thomas. I.T. Thomas. And Thomas was this man who so loved Haiti when he spoke of Haiti. Everybody wanted to be in the Haiti that he saw. And that's the Haiti you've just described. So thank you for introducing us to your Haiti. What's your name? What's your name? Giselle. Giselle Dubrose. So, Haiti Giselle. All right. <laughs> so, uh, your phone numbers or your email addresses if you want to receive communication. I really want to thank you for your attention. You know, your time and your attention are yours. And you gave them generously tonight. I want to thank you for that. All right.